We've talked a lot, probably about three hours worth, about American culture between the end of the War of uh, 1812 and the 1840s. Now we're going to back up and we're going to go back to the end of that war and uh, pick up the thread of the political narrative. Talk about the uh, uh, national things that, that, that happened as so far as politics go. And uh, we're going to start at the very end of the war. This painting is uh, a painting of the uh, signing of the Treaty of Ghent um, in, in Belgium, which was the, uh, the treaty that, that ended the war signed on Christmas Eve, 1814. Uh, a few weeks before Andrew Jackson, if you will recall, um, attacked the city of New Orleans. Well, um, initially, after the war was over, the U.S. was uh, was in a bit of a bind because, once again, they were deeply in debt because they had to pay for a war. So uh, a new economic plan was proposed, and this new plan was going to be uh, uh, going to be bandied about for the next uh, quarter of a century or so. Uh, it was called the American System, and it was the brainchild of the Speaker of the House, Congressman Henry Clay of Kentucky. And I have here pictured some of the other major players at this time, all of whom supported uh, Clay's. Uh, efforts to, to, to pass legislation to get this American system going, and I'll tell you what it is in a moment, uh, but you've got the uh, sitting president at that time, James Madison. You also have the Secretary of State, James Monroe, both of whom supported Clay's ideas. Also, Clay's fellow congressman, who, like him, uh, had been a war hawk and who, like him, was becoming more and more prominent with each passing year, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Also supporting the plan was John Quincy Adams, who had been a Federalist, and who was a Federalist, actually, uh, at the very end of the war, but the Federalist Party crumbled, and then he became a Democratic-Republican. Uh, Quincy, John Quincy Adams, at this time, had spent several years as the ambassador to Russia, and then had actually been in charge of negotiating the Treaty of Ghent, after which he was the ambassador to Great Britain. He would, uh, in just a, a year or two after this, replace James Monroe as Secretary of State when Monroe, uh, well, uh, got a higher position. John Quincy Adams, by the way, first time I think that we're mentioning him, but we'll be mentioning him frequently, was the son of John Adams, uh, whom we talked about quite a bit, and who was still alive at this time. Now, Henry's, uh, Henry Clay's American System plan was based uh, on the, uh, uh, the proposals and the ideas of Alexander Hamilton from back in the 1790s, uh, it was basically the kind of stuff Hamilton had been trying to get uh, pushed through as a legislation, and some of it he successfully did, but some of it he had not. So um, we've been sort of uh, name-dropping that plan. Let's talk about what the plan actually was. The American system. Um, it was for economic development of the country. The first thing that it called for was a new national bank. Now remember, one of Hamilton's big things was trying to get a national bank uh, established, and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison had, had opposed it, and then they had made that deal, if you recall, um, in which, in exchange for the capital being built in the South, uh, Hamilton, Hamilton got some of the things he wanted, including a national bank. However, it only had a 20-year charter. So Congress passed the law establishing the National Bank in 1791, and the charter expired in 1811. Um, it was not renewed because 1812, all of a sudden, the country was pretty busy and Washington was being burned to the ground, if you will recall. Uh, so it had to take a few year, years off from this. So now 
now that the war is over, uh, the National Bank is being called for, for to, to return, the second National Bank. Also, a protective tariff, uh, which essentially was a tax, and, and this one was 25 to 30 percent tax on imported items coming in from outside the country. Now, that was to protect American commerce and American businesses because with this, uh, these tariffs being put on foreign goods, that made the foreign goods more expensive, and so people could save money by buying American. Um, the third part uh, called for federal funds to be used for infrastructure projects, primarily building roads and canals. Remember that discussion that we had about the uh, market revolution and the transportation revolution and how important all that was. So uh, Clay is the Speaker of the House. Uh, he is working on getting this legislation through. It was supported by President Madison, despite the fact you know, that Madison had opposed uh, these same ideas 20 years earlier when they were Hamilton's ideas, but now he saw the, uh, saw the necessity of getting a handle on the economy. Now, some people criticized these plans, such as uh, establishing a national bank uh, or these infrastructure uh, plans, by saying the Constitution does not specifically authorize the federal government to do those things. So uh, these were strict constructionists. And when they raised those issues, people in favor of the plan, uh, who either were or were in the process of becoming loose constructionists, were able to say, oh yeah, strict constructionism, that's what, uh, that's what your party calls for. Didn't Thomas Jefferson do an end around on that and buy Louisiana? Uh, so shut up, uh, essentially. And now, there was a lot of pressure against the American system coming from well, there's some pressure coming from the West, but there was a lot of pressure coming from the South because Southern politicians believed that this, this economic plan, which essentially through taxes all the states were going to be contributing to, um, wasn't going to help the South. It was all going to help the North, especially the canals part. Uh, and the South really didn't need new markets opened up. Uh, as the North did, wanting to open up those markets in the Midwest, the South, with their uh, growing power of King Cotton, uh, why they had all the markets that they could ever ask for. So they were opposed to it. Um, however, 1816, the Second Bank of the United States was, was uh, passed in Congress, and it was renewed with another 20-year charter. Now, the point of the, the, the National Bank, one of the big points was to, uh, to, to issue money and prevent local banks from overproducing paper money so the national bank would regulate how much money could be printed because you know if you just keep you just keep printing money it's, it gets devalued all right well the uh, the bank was located in Philadelphia and again the goal was um, to sort of regulate commerce and, and kind of keep things under control, but it didn't work that way. Instead, the National Bank speculated. That is to say that they, they invested uh, money in projects hoping to get good returns on those projects uh, from those projects that could then add to the money in the, uh, in the Treasury. And right after the end of the war, 1815, there was a land boom as more lands were being opened up and these transportation advances were making it more accessible to get those lands. So everybody was buying up land in what was then um, the old Northwest. And uh, it, was, it was a bubble. It was, uh, well, perhaps you've heard that expression used for the economy, when there's a bubble, things get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the mistake many people make is assuming it's going to always keep getting bitter, bigger, so they start putting money in it too. But the bigger it gets, the more likely that eventually, what's it going to do? 
it's going to burst. It's going to pop. And the uh, U.S. economy did just that in 1819. The panic of 1819, which uh, means that uh, people uh, lost, lost trust in the banks and made a run on the banks, asking for their money back, or for the money that they had invested. Um, banks throughout the throughout the country. Now, what does that what does that mean? Why is that bad? Well, a bank holds money, and you can go to that bank and you can borrow money from the bank. Where do they get the money to loan you? From other people, from depositors who put their money in the bank uh, to keep it safe and to uh, earn interest. Uh, usually a small amount of interest each year. Uh, and so, you know, the longer you keep your money in there, the more interest you get, the more money's added to it. And all that works great as long as there are people putting money in that can then be distributed through loans to other people who then will repay the loans with interest. And so that's making more money, right? That provides the money to pay the interest uh, to the depositors. But the problem is the bank doesn't have all the money in there at the same time, right? Uh, they've got some of that money loaned out. So if one person decides, I put money in the bank, I want to take all my money out of the bank, that's no big deal. But if everybody decides to take their money out of the bank, that's a huge deal because everybody's not going to get it because it's not all in there at one time. And so that's what leads to a panic. And panics often lead to uh, depressions, recessions or depressions. So this panic uh, wiped out uh, the fortunes of a lot of people who had invested money in the banks. And a lot of people blamed the National Bank for the whole situation for not regulating things like they were supposed to, but for jumping in, uh, jumping on the bandwagon of land speculation, trying to, to make more money. Now, some states decided, because a lot of people blame the National Bank for this, some states decided to raise money by taxing the local state branch of the National Bank. And that, uh, that presents a, a, a quandary. Does a state have the right to tax the federal, the, the national government? This went all the way to the Supreme Court where uh, the Chief Justice at that time was John Marshall in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland, 1819. A landmark case, one of the most important cases of the 19th century, in which it was established that A, the National Bank is constitutional. And because it is constitutional, that means that the, uh, the federal government has the authority to do it, Therefore, states can't tax it. So that's two different, uh, two different principles that are being established. A, uh, states cannot um, tax the, the national government if the national government is behaving uh, according to the Constitution. And B, anything that the Constitution doesn't specifically say the government can't do or that only states can do can be done if, and this is the wording, it was, quote, necessary and proper to uh, promote the general welfare. So that's a big victory for loose constructionism. All right. Well, um, 1816 election, we talked about that earlier um, when we were discussing the collapse of the Federalist Party. That was the last year the Federalists had a presidential candidate. Uh, he didn't do very well if you will recall. James Monroe, the uh, Democratic-Republican, former Secretary of State, easily defeated the Federalist Rufus King. Uh, Rufus King had been on the Federalist ticket as vice president, I think, a couple of times before. So Monroe becomes the next president, uh, the fifth president of the United States, like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, and come to think of it, like George Washington. James Monroe was from Virginia, the son of a wealthy plantation owner. During the American Revolution, he had been a, uh, a mid-level officer in the Continental Army, 
uh, and he had studied law under Thomas Jefferson. So as this mid-level officer, perhaps you will recall this uh, painting that we looked at uh, way back, uh, Washington crossing the Delaware. There is James Monroe standing right behind George Washington holding the flag. Well, the, uh, the Federalists were able to put up a candidate in 1816. 1820, when Monroe ran for re-election, the Federalists were just uh, in the process of disappearing completely. They could not even get it together to come up with a candidate, and they did cease to exist shortly after this. So Monroe essentially ran unopposed with 99.5% of the popular vote. A few people uh, wrote in uh, John Quincy Adams um, and I think DeWitt Clinton. Uh, they both got some votes, but uh, the, uh, the Electoral College, everything went to James Monroe because there's only one political party now, which was a kind of a, kind of a bizarre situation to have political parties, but only have one of them. This, this time period, essentially Monroe's two uh, terms in office from 1816 to 1824, or more accurately from 1817 to 1825, oddly uh, is, enough, is referred to sometimes as the era of good feelings. By 1820 between because no North one was arguing about political parties. Had a whole lot to because do with there was the nothing West, to argue about. There's only particularly one the lands open. However. Up by the Louisiana That purpose. doesn't mean that everyone had good feelings, really. That doesn't mean there was no division. There was very, very severe division. It just wasn't along the lines of political parties. It was along sectional lines or regional lines. It was North and South. Uh, Republicans in the North and Republicans in the South. Uh, that was the source of division during a Monroe's tenure. So let's start by taking another look at the territory gained in that purchase. Here is the, uh, the land area that was gained in the purchase of Louisiana from France. You can see a great big chunk of territory, of property. Now, east of the Louisiana Purchase, in the United States at that time, you had several states. Uh, but also, you will note that north of Kentucky and Tennessee, you had Indiana Territory. And south of Kentucky and Tennessee, you had Mississippi territory. Uh, those were areas that had been opened up previously to the Louisiana Purchase by the gaining of uh, what used to be called the West and didn't have enough people living in them to qualify yet for statehood. Now, Florida at that time was being controlled by Spain. Well, let's take a look at the actual states of the United States as of 1803. Um, here you can see the, uh, at that point, 16 states, the original 13 colonies plus Vermont, and then Kentucky, and then Tennessee had all been added by 1800. Now, Maine, up there in the uh, far northeastern corner, uh, Maine was at that time a part of Massachusetts, even though New Hampshire was in between them, but it was considered part of Massachusetts. All right, well, 1803, around the time that uh, negotiations were about to begin with France to uh, uh, offer to buy New Orleans, which would turn into the Louisiana Purchase, Ohio was added as a state. All right, well, Louisiana Purchase occurs, the territory is acquired. Uh, then in the decade of the 18 teens, from uh, between, well, 1812 and 1819 specifically, five new states were added. Uh, Indiana and Illinois 
carved up out of Indiana Territory up there. And then uh, Mississippi Territory was divided into two states, Mississippi and Alabama, and Louisiana itself, the state as we know it, was, was added to the Union. Well, by 1819, when you now had all of these states, there were enough people living in Missouri that they were petitioning for statehood. However, However, this, uh, this led to some controversy because there was a lot of disagreement about what to do with those uh, new areas gained from France, not counting actually Louisiana itself, what to do about slavery because, you know, a lot of people in the North didn't want to see slavery expand. And a lot of people in the South did. What's that going to mean for new states that are formed west of the Mississippi River, like potentially Missouri? Now, why was it a concern? Um, for, for the people in the South who supported slavery, there was a really big need to continue expanding westward because the whole point that they were holding on to slavery was uh, the ramped up production of cotton due to the invention of the cotton gin, which by 1920 had become a really big factor and was transforming the life, culture, and economy of the South. But the problem was that uh, cotton depletes the soil if you don't rotate the crops and rest your fields and no one wanted to rest their fields because that meant not making money from those fields that year. So they had already begun to exhaust some of the, uh, the soil and some of the fields in the South that had first started planting uh, cotton. So they needed to continually get access to more land further west uh, in order to sustain that uh, cotton economy. Now, people in the North um, were somewhat, uh, some of them invested in the cotton industry, but there was a lot of, um, a lot of politics involved with this. The, uh, uh, the problem was that the South because of the three-fifths compromise in the Constitution that allowed Southern states to count 60% of their slave population in their state population and therefore determining how many members of the House of Representatives they get, wound up with far more people in Congress uh, proportionally than really they would have been entitled to without counting any of their slaves, which people in the North didn't think they should be able to do. And as a result of that, the South had dominated politics. So uh, think about this. Of the first seven presidents, Andrew Jackson being the seventh, five of them were Southern slaveholders. The only two who were not were... Uh, uh, John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, both from Massachusetts. Um, and Congress was dominated by the South because, you know, the, the increased uh, proportionally number of representatives they had. Therefore, they were able to protect the uh, institution of slavery in the capital. Now, as, as uh, the U.S. extends westward, with every new state that is gained west of the Mississippi, you're going to get two new senators and a number of new representatives for the House of Representatives. If all those states can be slave states, then the number of pro-slavery senators and representatives is going to keep growing and growing and growing. The, uh, the proportion of them, and their power in Washington over the, the whole rest of the country is going to keep growing and growing and growing. Now, there was also 
uh, anti-slavery feeling, but abolitionism was not really getting, it was around this time it was starting to get into full swing in the United States, actually in the 1820s. Um, and there was some feeling about the immorality of slavery, but that's not something that was heavily, heavily emphasized by people in, in the North in the early, the very early 19th century, not, not to the extent that it would be later. Well, what are we going to do um, so far as new slave states? There was a compromise offered in, uh, in 1819, fall of 1819, uh, of allowing Missouri in, because they already had 10,000 slaves there, uh, allowing them in, but... Um, Representative James Talmadge of New York proposed that a restriction be included in the, uh, in the act. So it's called the Talmadge Restriction. Uh, he proposed that the law B will allow Missouri to become a state, but no further slaves can be brought in beyond the 10,000 who were already there. And that the children of those 10,000 slaves would all be freed, each be freed at the age of 25, so that there could be slavery now, because people had already brought their slaves, but it was going to be basically forced to die out. Now, this passed the House of Representatives, but it failed in the Senate, so it did not become law. It did not become part of the compromise, but it is worth noting there was enough support for this that it passed the House of Representatives. So ultimately the compromise that was hammered out and uh, one of the principal figures doing the, the hammering, doing the negotiating and doing the compromising was uh, Henry Clay of Kentucky, who would become known as the great compromiser. Uh, and that was not meant as an insult at that time, but as a compliment, right? being able to get things done by bringing two sides together. So the compromise uh, that Clay proposed was, let's just drop this whole Talmadge restriction thing. Um, we'll drop that. Um, the concern about adding a new slave state and how that's going to affect Congress could be mitigated if two states were brought in at the same time. One that was a slave state and one that was a free state. And the proposal was, let's allow Maine to become a state. So with Maine and Missouri, two new states, that would be four new senators, two in favor of slavery and two against it. And the same thing with the House of Representatives. So that'll balance things out. But then after that, after, after Missouri is allowed in, then there would be a line established, a line uh, that was the 3630 parallel, or as you can tell here in this map, essentially the western border of Tennessee and Kentucky would just keep extending all the way to the Pacific coast. And what would happen, uh, and this, this did pass, what would happen is that any new states added after Missouri if they were above that green line there, they could not have slavery. If they were below that green line, they could have slavery. Now the map is a map of the United States as of January, 1850. So 30 years after this Missouri Compromise, as it's sometimes called, or the Compromise of 1820 was passed. So in that time, several new states were gained. Um, now those on this map, by the way, the blue states are states where there is no slavery. The red states are the states where there was slavery. So you can see any area that sticks up above that, that green line that already had slavery in 1820 got to keep it. So that's Kentucky, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, uh, and also Missouri. Got to, uh, got to keep slavery. That was part of the compromise. But after Missouri, 
that was the cutoff. So the new areas that were added, the new states that were added over the next 30 years below that parallel, and those states were Florida, Arkansas, and Texas would be slave states. And the new states that were added above that parallel, which would be Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa, would be free states. With the idea being, this is going to maintain the balance. Now, this was a compromise, like any compromise. It leaves both sides somewhat dissatisfied because they didn't get everything they wanted. Um, how long is this going to last? Well, we can see from the map it lasted at least until 1850. Spoiler alert, things will change after that. Uh, but I do want to mention kind of uh, a, it was a totally a coincidence, but it is a bit of an irony that just a few months after the Missouri Compromise was, uh, was made in Missouri, Daniel Boone died of old age at 80 years old. And so I say it's kind of ironic. It's kind of symbolic in a way because this, uh, with his death and with the Missouri Compromise, you essentially had the end of one frontier era in America and the beginning of a different one. I feel like the divide between North and South by 1820 can really be demonstrated by looking at our writings from the time from two different individuals. So I have some very, very lengthy quotes here because I think it's important that you actually hear the words that were spoken or written. And I'm going to have these, these uh, individuals' pictures up for the, the most part while I'm reading those quotes. And I'm gonna have the, the, the quotes themselves kind of quickly flash across the screen so you can, you can pause, you can go back uh, and read them uh, for yourself if you wish. Now, the first person that we're going to look at is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had been out of office as president for 12 years at this time. He was 77 years old. And uh, this is from a letter that he wrote to a friend about the situation uh, and the proposal to have that dividing line allowing uh, slavery to the south of it and no slavery in new territories to the north of it. So I'm going to read his words and I'm going to stop every now and then and kind of uh, rephrase or summarize what he just said uh, so as to uh, emphasize certain points, but also to, you know, make it uh, a little more contemporary. Here's what Jefferson had to say. I had for a long time ceased to read the newspapers or pay any attention to public affairs, but this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union, the death knell. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated, and every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper. I can say with conscious truth that there is not a man on earth who would sacrifice more than I would to relieve us from this heavy reproach that is slavery in any practicable way. The cession of that kind of property, slaves, for so it is misnamed, is a bagatelle which would not cost me a second thought if in that way a general emancipation and expatriation could be effected. So let's, uh, let's revisit that. The cession of that kind of property, giving up slavery, which should not even be called property, he's saying, is a bagatelle. What is a bagatelle? It is a cheap piece of jewelry that's not really worth anything. 
Uh, he said, it's like a cheap piece of jewelry. It wouldn't cost me a second thought if it could be done in such a way that all the slaves could be freed and moved somewhere else. Moved somewhere else. He continues, and gradually and with due sacrifices, I think it might be. But as it is, we have the wolf by the ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale, and self-preservation in the other. So he's saying that he believes gradually slavery is going to end, and it will require some sacrifice. Uh, but he's saying the way things stand right now, we have the wolf by the ear which means it's not safe to hold on, and it's not safe to let go. We're stuck, he's saying. And then he says, justice is in one scale, and self-preservation in the other. So he's saying that keeping slavery is an injustice. It would be justice to free them. That's on one side of the scale, but on the other side is self-preservation, because he believed, like a lot of people, at the time, that if the slaves were all freed at once, there would be a massive race war as they sought to take revenge against the people who had enslaved them. He believed it was impossible for white people and black people to live peacefully uh, among one another or even next to one another. Now, bear in mind that he is of the generation, and this was still still believed by, by people uh, uh, most people, even slaveholders by 1820, uh, the generation that, that believed slavery was wrong, but that we were stuck with it, and that it would have to be allowed to gradually fade away as it had in the North. Okay? Of course, that's not going to happen because now there's the cotton gin. And finally, he says... I regret that I am now to die in the belief that the useless sacrifice of themselves by the generation of 76 to acquire self-government and happiness to their country is to be thrown away by the unwise and unworthy passions of their sons, and that my only consolation is to be that I live not to weep over it. So that's, that's, I find that very poignant. He's saying that all the things that they did in 1776 were for nothing because their sons and grandsons were going to throw it all away. And the only thing, the only consolation he could take is he's almost dead. And so he's not going to live to see it happen. Then he says, if they would but dispassionately weigh the blessings they will throw away by freeing slaves or by having this compromise, against an abstract principle more likely to be affected by union than by scission, they would pause before they would perpetrate this act of suicide on themselves and of treason against the hopes of the world. If they would only dispassionately weigh what was going on, if they would only weigh what they're going to be losing by having this compromise and dividing the country with a line for something that he says is more likely to be affected by union than by scission. So it's all about slavery. He's saying slavery is more likely to be done away with if the country is not divided by a line. And that if only the present day politicians would think about this kind of like the people at the, uh, the uh, Philadelphia uh, Convention, the Continental Congress, and the, uh, later the uh, Constitutional Convention had done, if only they would stop and think about it, they would pause before they would perpetrate this act of suicide. He's saying, this is going to destroy the country, this dividing it into two parts, north and south. It's going to destroy the country. It's suicide and it is treason against the hopes of the world. What does that mean? Well, we're calling back now the, uh, the ideas of Thomas Paine. 
and uh, how those ideas were incorporated by so many of the founding fathers' generation. The idea that this republic, with no monarch, but of the people and by the people and for the people, could be done. It could be done and it could inspire other countries around the world to rally against tyranny or to come join the United States in, in their experiment for this uh, democratic republic. He's saying, by doing what you're doing right now with this compromise and dividing the country into two parts, you're destroying all hope of that happening, and the rest of the world that was inspired by the United States will instead despair. They will see that uh, this type of government is not possible to sustain because already within one generation, it will have destroyed itself. So when I read these words by Thomas Jefferson, uh, like I said, it's, it's kind of poignant. It always kind of gets me a little bit to think about this guy in the twilight of his life, seeing the things that he had done being undone. Now remember, so much, so much of the Founding Fathers' uh, approach to establishing this new government was based on, on compromise, on giving, uh, on each side giving in uh, to some degree. Now, this is a compromise that Henry Clay has, has brokered, but the result is going to be a division. So that's, that's Thomas Jefferson, and I think that he speaks for the way that a lot of people felt, particularly in the South, at this time about slavery. Now, though, we're going to look at someone else someone who is uh, more actively involved in politics at this time than Jefferson is, the sitting Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. Now, this uh, next part that I'm going to read is from uh, the diary of John Quincy Adams, and he's talking about a discussion that he had with his good friend, John C. Calhoun, a slave owner from South Carolina, after listening to the debates in the uh, in, in in Congress about this uh, about this proposed compromise, after this meeting, I walked home with Calhoun, who said that the principles which I had avowed were just and noble. That is liberty and freedom but that in the southern country, whenever they were mentioned, they were always understood as applying only to white men. Domestic labor was confined to blacks, and such was the prejudice that if he, who was the most popular man in his district, were to keep a white servant in his house, his character and reputation would be irretrievably ruined. I said that this confounding of ideas of servitude and labor was one of the bad effects of slavery but he thought it attended with many excellent consequences. I told Calhoun I could not see things in the same light. It is, in truth, all perverted sentiment, mistaking labor for slavery and dominion for freedom. The discussion of this Missouri question has betrayed the secret of their souls. In the abstract, they admit that slavery is an evil. They disclaim all participation in the introduction of it and cast it all upon the shoulders of our old grandam Britain. But when probed to the quick upon it, they show, at the bottom of their souls, pride and vainglory in their condition of masterdom. It is among the evils of slavery that it taints the very sources of moral principle. It establishes false estimates of virtue and vice. For what can be more false and heartless than this doctrine which makes the first and holiest rights of humanity to depend upon the color of the skin? If the union must be dissolved, slavery is precisely the question upon which it ought to break. For the present, however, this contest is laid asleep. So here he is walking along with his friend John Calhoun, the slave owner from South Carolina, who is trying to explain to John Quincy Adams 
all this talk about uh, liberty and, and, and freedom, you have to understand that's, that's, that's only for white people. Uh, and that uh, the prejudice against uh, uh, black people and equating black people with servitude was so strong in South Carolina that someone like John C. Calhoun couldn't even hire a white butler. It would be a scandal because you're putting a white person in a demeaning position. Adams replied, that's part of the problem of slavery. It enhances this, uh, this hypocrisy of trying to defend this, this idea that is indefensible. And this is perhaps, uh, I think, the most important part of that uh, passage. He said, they have betrayed the secret of their souls. And he's talking about Southerners. He's talking about people like Thomas Jefferson. They have betrayed the secret of their souls. They claim that they recognize slavery is evil. And they blame it all on Britain for having introduced it to the colonies to begin with and talk like they, can't, they just can't possibly get rid of it. But they're betraying the secret of their souls. The secret of their souls is that they like it. They like being masters. They like setting themselves up almost as gods over other human beings. They like how that feels, and they're not going to let go of it. But they recognize it would sound bad to say that. Therefore, they have all these arguments about why it has to be done gradually, if at all. And John Quincy Adams says in what I think is the second most important part of this uh, passage, if the Union will break apart over the issue of slavery, well, so be it. That's the one thing it should break apart over if it's going to break apart because you should either have slavery or not have slavery. And that if there's going to be an insistence that it continue, the Union itself is a farce and a sham. And all the talk about liberty and freedom and equality are meaningless. If people have slaves... And I think that, um, you know, whereas Thomas Jefferson's words are very affecting, uh, very poignant, uh, John Quincy Adams' words cut to the quick of things. They really do get to the bottom of things. Uh, they, are, they are loaded with truth, I believe.
But, as John Quincy Adams said, the matter had quieted down for now. Almost as though he suspected there would be more trouble later on. Well, before we, uh, before we move on from James Monroe's administration, there is one other element of it that I want to talk about. Uh, one other element of uh, freedom and liberty. Uh, but in order to do that, we're going to have to travel south of the border and talk about this guy, Simon Bolivar, who is sometimes referred to as the Latin American George Washington. You see, there were, uh, uh, there were a series of revolutions in the 18, starting in the 18 teens, lasting up into the 1820s, where what had been known as New Spain, that was essentially all of South America except Brazil, and uh, like French Guiana and a couple of small places like that, and uh, Central America, uh, had all been part of the Spanish Empire, but the different provinces started to uh, started to rebel and started to proclaim their independence. There was actually a global movement by the 1820s of uh, formerly colonized people seeking to uh, uh, to get out from under the the power of uh, their colonizers and become independent, uh, independent republics. A whole bunch of them sprang up, uh, beginning with uh, Mexico, uh, beginning in uh, 1810, and then it was several years later before the, uh, the government was officially formed. Uh, Colombia, Chile, Paraguay, Venezuela, Argentina, Peru, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Brazil, Bolivia, Uruguay. Um, and Simon Bolivar was involved in several of those countries uh, getting their independence and was elected as president of four different countries, Venezuela, Gran Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. So all of a sudden you've got a bunch of much smaller countries rather than what was uh, previously known as New Spain, including, including Mexico. Now, a lot of people were fearful in the United States that this would be sort of an open invitation for European powers to sweep in, to swoop in, while these new governments were trying to get established, to kind of swoop in and take them over using their superior force of arms, because as brand new countries, they were, they were not that strong yet. And this is why, in 1823, James Monroe uh, released what became known as the Monroe Doctrine, which in essence said the United States would oppose any further attempt at European colonization in the Americas. Now, uh, any European power that still had a colony would be allowed to keep that colony, and therefore Spain held on to Cuba, for example. But uh, there would not be any uh, European countries coming in to establish new colonies or take over newly independent ones. In return, the United States would mind their business. You stay out of our backyard, we'll stay out of yours. The U.S. pledged not to get involved in the wars of Europe. And, of course, uh, as I said, uh, not only would uh, Europe not be allowed to make any new colonies, they would not be allowed to interfere with those newly independent states of Latin America. So that was, uh, that was in force for uh, a very long time. In essence, you could say it's still in force because uh, the idea of Europeans colonizing these uh, independent countries is something that has not been allowed. Although, although France did try it uh, in Mexico when the U.S. was distracted in the 1860s, in the American Civil War. Later on, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is going to expand on the Monroe Doctrine with something called the Roosevelt Corollary that essentially says no one can interfere in South America except us uh, because, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're the neighbors. But uh, uh, that's what the Monroe Doctrine is. We will probably mention Monroe one more time when we talk about the establishment of the African colony of Liberia 
later on, and you'll just have to wait to see how President Monroe and the United States fits into that. <laughs> 